All right, so this is laboratory number two. We're doing a, a submax VO2 test. So before we get into what we're actually going to do today, I'm going to talk about a few concepts that we might look at. So first is this idea of exercise efficiency and economy. And efficiency is energy produced over energy consumed. So if you think about a machine or maybe a car, you can think about uh, how much they output compared to how much they take in, right? So something that puts out more than it takes in is, is something that we consider efficient. Uh, however, when we have somebody that's exercising, there's a lot of energy that's produced that we can't really measure, right? We have work, we have heat. Um, the human body is, is much more complex. So the physics definition won't really work for us uh, in terms of efficiency. So physiologists have come up with a term of economy, okay? And so that's just the oxygen use divided by the work rate. Okay, so how much oxygen you use compared to uh, how much work or how much power you can produce. Okay, now again, if you look at that term work rate, right, so some of you might say, uh, you know, it's work, why is it in terms of watts? What's well, work rate? And remember that uh, watts are a measurement of power, and power equals work divided by time. And uh, work divided by time is synonymous with work rate. So really what we're looking at is power. And then oxygen is something that we're going to measure in liters. right? So if you look at the units that we have economy in, we're going to have liters for oxygen, and then we're going to have watts for work rate. Okay? You can also do this uh, in milliliters per kg per watt to look at somebody's body weight. OK, so for energy expenditure, uh, we're going to look at oxygen consumption, and uh, we're going to use that to kind of give us an idea of what energy expenditure is. And we can do this because we know that one liter of oxygen consumed uh, equals about five calories. Okay, so if you consume one liter of oxygen, uh, you'll burn about five calories. Okay, and then O2 consumption will be measured using open circuit spirometry. Open circuit spirometry is just a fancy set of words to really say. We're going to take oxygen in uh, from the atmosphere, from the room that we're in, right? So it's an open circuit. We're going to breathe that in uh, through our system, and then we're going to breathe it out, and we're going to have a face mask on. Uh, and we're going to breathe it out and into a tube, and then into our computer. And our computer will analyze the gases. It'll tell us how much oxygen is in, is in there, how much CO2 is in there. Uh, and it'll also give us an idea of RER, right? And RER is just CO2 uh, divided by O2. Right, and RER will be low if we're at a low energy expenditure, and if we're at a higher workload, then our RER will increase. Right. So the units for oxygen consumption is usually liters per minute or milliliters per kilogram per minute. Obviously, one of those is scale to body weight, and one of those is not. Um, and then another unit that uh, we might use is the MET. And I don't know if any of you have heard of you have heard about this, but uh, a MET is just scaled to your resting oxygen consumption, right? And your resting oxygen consumption is 3.5 milliliters per kg per minute. Okay, so it's just a way of measuring the milliliters per kg per minute, and it's a scale where uh, one MET equals 3.5 milliliters per kg per minute. Okay, so this is a graph that you should be very familiar with. Uh, so you might have to draw it on a test or maybe make it in a lab report. So uh, know what you're looking at here. So first, if this is just a submax uh, VO2 bout of exercise, right? So we have VO2 on the y-axis and then exercise time on the x-axis. Because we're looking at how the volume of oxygen changes over time uh, during exercise. Okay? So we have this uh, oxygen deficit, which is where our oxygen supply is not equal to our oxygen demand when we first start exercising, right? We have this, all of a sudden we start exercising, we have this high demand for oxygen, but our body's just not ready for it, and so we have an oxygen deficit. Now, really what occurs here is we have our anaerobic systems are working uh, primarily, right? So if our aerobic systems need oxygen, but our oxygen supply isn't where we need it, then our aerobic systems can't work that well. So we're going to rely more on our anaerobic systems uh, during this oxygen deficit time. Okay. Now, if you're a trained athlete, then your oxygen deficit is going to be pretty 
too small. All right, it just means that you can reach the steady state sooner if you're a trained athlete. You guys will talk about this a little bit more uh, later on in the semester about adaptations to, to exercise and training. But uh, basically, when you're a trained athlete, you're more sensitive to ADP. Right? So when you start exercising, your ATP breaks down into ADP. All right? And uh, if you're more sensitive to this change, uh, the ADP actually stimulates uh, our aerobic process. It stimulates oxidative phosphorylation. So if our ADP stimulates oxidative phosphorylation and our trained athlete is sensitive to that change, then they will hit their uh, aerobic, or they'll hit steady state sooner. Right? Their aerobic systems will start working sooner and they're going to reach steady state sooner. Okay? So a trained athlete will have a smaller O2 deficit. So finally, uh, after a, a few minutes, or you know, a little bit longer, based on your training status, you can have uh, you'll hit steady state, right? So steady state is just when your oxygen consum uh, consumption is equal to your oxygen demand, right? Oxygen supply is equal to oxygen demand. That's the steady state, okay? And so this will happen as you're you know on a bike run while you run, as long as your oxygen supply is equal to your oxygen demand, uh, you can continue in a steady state for an extended period of time. Okay, so finally, when you decide to stop exercising, you'll have this thing called EPOC. Okay, and EPOC is excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. Okay, so if we break that down, we know what oxygen consumption is, right? Now, the P is uh, post-exercise, so it's after we exercise, and then the excess just means that we're consuming more oxygen than you would expect uh, now that we're at rest, okay? And so there's a uh, fast phase and a slow phase to EPOC. Now, the fast phase involves restoring your ATP uh, in your PCR stores, and it involves restoring your oxygen stores. Okay, that happens fairly quickly. Then there's also a slow phase, and these things take some time, uh, one of which is turning the lactate that you've produced during the exercise back into glycogen. Okay, you also have to, uh, your hormone levels have to come back to normal and your body temperature will take a while to get back to normal. Okay, so those are all, those three things are all part of the slow phase. Okay, so the EPOC has a fast phase and a slow phase. You should know uh, which things make up fast, the fast phase and which things make up the slow phase. Okay, so again, these are graphs that you're going to have to know, so uh, make sure you know what you're looking at. So first look at the graph on the left, and it's VO2 versus work rate, okay? And so, if we think about this as we, as we pedal on a bike, uh, if our work rate is low, then we expect that we won't consume a lot of oxygen, right? Uh, however, if we increase the work rate, uh, then we'll probably start to consume more oxygen, right? Because it's a greater workload and we have to produce more energy uh, to, to go against that work, or to go against that workload, okay? Uh, during the test today, the submax VO2, we're going to be doing uh, something in the lower range. So it's going to be lower workloads, and so we probably won't consume a lot of oxygen. So if you want to participate in a lab, this will probably be going to participate in. It's fairly simple. Uh, and then next week for the VO2 max, now we're going to start looking at this relationship between VO2 and work rate and how VO2 will reach a maximum. Okay, So even as we increase the work rate, our VO2 won't increase. But uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Basically, our submax work range is going to be low. We'll be doing low work rates, and uh, we probably won't consume too much oxygen. Now, on the right, you're going to see VO2 versus exercise time. So again, the three main components are oxygen deficit, steady state, and EPOC. Okay. Now, you notice in these two, two graphs, you have light exercise versus heavy exercise versus the, the top and the bottom graph. Right? And so we can see on the top one that oxygen deficit uh, lasts a certain amount of time. But the heavy exercise, uh, it's debatable that uh, it looks like the person never really reaches steady state. The oxygen deficit occurs during the whole bout of exercise. Okay? Um, also, we can see that the EPOC is also a lot larger in the heavy exercise as compared to the light exercise. Right? And so if we look at the oxygen deficit, we would say that this person had to depend more on their anaerobic systems 
uh, at this heavy exercise than they would if they were doing a light bout of exercise, right? You could say that they barely reached their steady state if they did at all. So it looks like their option supply almost never really equal their option demand, okay? But uh, you should know these two graphs. Notice that the graph on the left is VO2 versus work rate, right? And then the graph on the right is VO2 versus exercise time, okay? And you're probably going to have to draw these graphs sometime in the future. Um, so know the components, uh, know your axes, 